Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today I would like to talk about the probably the most important notion in category theory, whatever most important really means, namely what are functors. So what is category theory all about? Well, I try to propose a little bit that category, it's not my proposal, okay? most people think this way, that category theory is more about arrows than objects. And things should be named after arrows and so on. So the arrows are the main players in categories. The maps are more important than the sets, if you want. It's kind of the main idea of category theory. And in some sense, category theory really takes itself serious. It takes its own philosophy serious. So in some sense, category theory, right? Take it serious. It should be about arrows, but it shouldn't be about categories. It should be about maps between categories. And these are exactly the functors um, I'm going to talk about in, in this video. So functors are maps between categories in the appropriate sense, of course, right? And they should be more important using the same philosophy of category theory always applies than categories. Of course, you kind of can push that even further. You can ask for maps between functors, which should be more important than functors. These are called natural transformations. And you can ask for maps between natural transformations and so on. But certainly on this first, it gets more complicated in each step. And certainly on this first level, um, this is what category proposes. So instead of studying categories, category theory actually studies functors. So maybe it should be called functor theory. Um, but as I said, this is kind of uh, redundant because then you should study maps between functors. So maybe it should be called maps between functors theory. And then you can study maps between maps between functors, you know. Anyway, um, so functors are certainly kind of this first level of, of generalization, this first level of errors, if you want. And they are just very important for the whole concept of category theory. So let me make an analogy. So whenever you learn something, you learn about vector spaces, you learn about uh, rings, you learn about groups. So here my picture is about groups. Um, then the map between them is kind of, kind of, these are really important. It takes you a while to digest it because you kind of learned groups uh, just from scratch, for example. And then there's more data going on. It's kind of the same as categories. You just know what a category is. And now someone wants to tell you about the maps between categories. But they're really more important. Keep this idea in mind. The maps, the relations between some things are more important than the objects itself, right? So if you want to think about categories as being objects, um, then arrows will be factors. So let's have a look at the analogy in groups. So what is a group homomorphism? What would be a map between groups? Well, there's only one thing you can write down because the group has only one operation. So in a group, you can multiply elements, right? So every map between groups should certainly, well, a group is also a set. So it should certainly be a group a map of sets, but it should do a little bit more. It should preserve the multiplication. And the equation you would write down is, is this one, F A B equals F A times F B, right? So uh, in my picture up here, uh, which I stole, of course, link is in the description. Um, they decided to go with G and G prime instead of A and B, but that doesn't really matter. So let's have a look. Uh, so G and G prime. And the only thing you can do in a group is you can multiply them. So whatever should be a group homomorphism should preserve this structure. So you get an F of, uh, F of G, you get an F of G prime, and the product is the product. That's kind of the point. So F is a map that preserves structure. It's kind of the classical approach. And uh, this is really the map in quotation marks, whatever the map means, but uh, anyway, it's certainly the map between groups because it preserves the only relevant structure, the multiplication. And this kind of general philosophy, you've seen that in many instances. So in rings, it would be a ring homomorphism. For a ring, for example, you have two uh, operations. It would have an addition and it would like to addition to be preserved, uh, something like this. And the same with multiplication. So you also have this property. For a ring, you would have both because you have both structures. Uh, for a vector space, you would have additional, uh, you won't have the multiplication, but you would have some scalar multiplication that should be preserved and everything, right? So many, many more. Whatever kind of structure your object has, an arrow should preserve that structure. That's a correct arrow in your category of objects, if you want. So the correct arrow in the category of groups is a group homomorphism because it preserves what makes a group a group. So let's have a look at a category. So what makes a category a category? Well, uh, diagrams. So um, what makes a category a category is the following. So you have a category C, here you have a category D, 
And what really matters is that you have some objects floating around X, Y, and Z. You have some arrows floating around. And all this stuff, all this data is part of a category and there will be compositions and so on. So whatever a functor is, if it's mapped between those things, it should take this diagram here and it should send it, so the functor is here is denoted F, it should send it to an appropriate, very similar looking diagram at the bottom. So let me just uh, explain that, what it means here. So, uh, so such a functor F, it's just so-called a functor, right? Group homomorphism is also pretty much a random name. And that was probably a reason why people called it functor. Um, but for me, it sounds like more like a random type of type of name. Like category is also pretty much a random type of name. There was probably, again, some motivation to call it category. I should have looked that up, by the way. But anyway, um, so it's called a functor. So what should it do? Well, let's have a look at the picture above. You certainly want to associate something to objects. So for each object, there's an associated object. So X maps to, if you want, F of X. And the same for all arrows. So for each arrow, here's F, and here you have F of F. F of F is a funny notation, but anyway, one of them is capital, one of them is small. So F should also associate arrows to arrows. And not just randomly, but because there's one extra structure here going on, namely you want it that such that the position is preserved, right? So a functor in the end should be nothing else than it sends objects to certain objects, right? The group homomorphism would send elements to elements, perfect. Uh, same here, but now there's an additional amount of information. You also need to send arrows to something, I mean to arrows, such that composition is preserved. And now we are addressing all of our properties of categories. So this looks like a really good definition of a map between categories, right? It sends a commutative diagram upstairs to a commutative diagram downstairs uh, in this picture here, at least, whatever upstairs and downstairs means in practice. Um, and that's kind of a map between categories. And it's just called a function. So let's have a look at an example. A really nice example is the so-called forgetful functor. Um, it's actually a very silly functor, but it's, it's, it's still good as an illustration. So forgetting is easy if you want. So what can, could this functor do? Well, in this example, I would like to go from k vector spaces to k subfield. So if you want q or r or whatever your favorite field is, um, two sets. And it works as follows. So you have in k-vector spaces, what are your objects? They're k-vector spaces, right? That's what they are. So let's say k and k squared. And the functors should associate to them something, because the functors should associate to object something, an object in a new category, so a set. And here comes a very naive way of doing this. Well, um, so this should be a k, and this should be a k squared. So k is just associated to k, and k squared is just associated to k squared but you just read it as a set and not as a vector space. You forget that there is a vector space structure on it. And same for the map, uh, any linear map is still a map. So just forget that it actually was a linear map to begin with. And you get factor from vect to set. And it's called a forgetful factor. And this kind of works in any richer category, whatever that means, to a lean category, like whatever. We'll see some examples uh, later on. Right, so this map is this map, a functor is a type of a map, if you want. This functor just forgets that X is a vector space and that F is a map. Right, so just forget it. Forgetting is easy. I'm very old. I tend to forget everything. Uh, I know that forgetting is very easy and kind of forget is kind of the blueprint example of a, of a non trivial functor. Right, it associates an object to an object by just forgetting additional structure and associates a map to a map or more, an arrow to an arrow by just forgetting additional structure. And then, well, we already discovered the definition. Let me just write it down. A functor from between two categories, so F uh, goes from, it's, it's written like a map, usually it goes from C to D, or like an arrow if you want, uh, because it should be an arrow in a certain type of category, uh, the category of categories. And such a functor associates to each object an object, so it's kind of what it needs to do. Um, point A and associates to each arrow an arrow and in, a, in an obvious way. So if F goes from X to Y, then F of F goes from F of X to F of Y. The only thing you can ever write down, right? That makes sense. Such that both properties of a category are preserved. I kind of need to swipe the first one on the rock always. Uh, I did it in the, in the video before, but there was a unit and the first is kind of the unitality. The unit should go to the unit. 
in coordinates, it would read like this. So f of the identity on x is the identity of f of x, unit goes to unit, not super important, but of course you need it for the definition because also part of the property. Uh, more important, this kind of proposition is preserved, was highlighted before uh, for group homomorphisms. By the way, you have seen this here sometimes, for example, for ring homomorphism, sometimes people want that f of one goes to one. It's something like that. Sometimes you need to add this assumption. And here you just need to add it. It doesn't come both ways. So the f of the identity should be like this. Anyway, so condition B is somehow more important. f of the composition should be the composition of the f's. Right? It's the composition is preserved. And the composition is kind of the only real structure that we have in a category in this generality. Um, it's kind of a fun thing. Uh, I listed some properties. So the identity functor is an even easier functor than forget. Uh, do, no, do nothing functor, just send everything to itself. It's certainly also a functor, it's certainly also a map, right? Um, composition of functors are functors. So actually functors themselves form uh, a category if you want, but we have that has to wait for a while. So um, propositions of functors are functors. That's what I'm trying to say. As, as usually, composition of group homomorphisms are group homomorphisms. Compositions of linear maps are linear maps. Composition of functors. Okay, so let's have a look at the category of categories. Right? Category theory takes itself serious. That's what I'm trying to sell here. Um, and well, if you have the notion of a map of an arrow between categories, then you can form cut the category of categories. It's also an object of study in category theory. Category theory studies itself, if you want. The category of categories, uh, what are the objects? The objects are something like ring, set, uh, whatever, Z mod, group, set, so it's categories, right? Set, ring, Z mod, uh, so um, abelian groups, if you want, Z modules. And there's certain arrows are functors between them. So here's an idea of what it could be. So from rings, for example, you could go to set, but just forget. Uh, the ring structure, but from rings you can also go to Z modules by forgetting the multiplication and then go further to set by forgetting just everything. And this diagram commutes. And usually people will draw a little circle here indicating this, this diagram commutes. This is a computing diagram in the category of categories. Kind of a fun thing. Um, here's another example. So from groups, you can still forget. You can forget that you have a group structure, you can go to sets, but there's a kind of a funny adjoin. Um, which I'm going to explain in, in another video, which is kind of the free functor. So for every set, you have a free group associated to it, and it also defines a functor, but this time going in the opposite direction from free to groups. It associates to each set a group and to each map a group homomorphism, which is actually pretty cool. And it doesn't always work. So um, forgetting is somehow very easy. Free is a little bit harder. Anyway, so you have this category of categories. Category theory takes itself serious up to some set theoretical nonsense that I should write the category of small categories, whatever, is a usual thing. You also can't have a set of sets uh, because it would contain itself and you would run into contradictions. But anyway, let's let's forget that. So um, there's a category of categories. Category theory takes itself serious and the uh, arrows are functors. And that's what it, that's the whole point here. So let me wrap up. I said it, I think three times or even more often, I apologize, I sound like a broken record, but category theory should take itself serious and it does. Functor is a correct arrow between categories. That's the category of categories. A functor is just kind of obvious thing you would write down. You associate something to each object, you associate something to each arrow, and composition is preserved. It's kind of the whole theory of categories could be called functor theory, overstressing things a little bit, of course, right now. Anyway, I hope you like functors. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope to see you next time.